Hi, my name is Renford Reese. I'm a professor in the political science department at Cal Poly Pomona and the founder director of the Prison Education Project. We're here today with former Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis. She was the first Latina ever chosen to be a cabinet secretary by a U.S. president. Her story is inspirational on so many different levels. She has been the consummate public servant and today we want to talk to her about her past, present, and future. Secretary Solis, glad to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, some people assume that successful people just magically become successful. In your case, assuming that you magically became a congressional representative representing the 31st and 32nd districts of the state of California, that you magically became the labor secretary in Obama's first administration. And what I want to do is to demystify this. I want to step back and I want to contextualize the Hill de Salis story. I want to embrace your trajectory from you being the daughter of immigrants all the way up until today, this moment where you're currently serving as a scholar in residence at your alma mater, Cal Poly Pomona. If I may, what was it like for you growing up in La Puente? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, first of all, and it is a, a pleasure and delight to be back here at Cal Poly Pomona as a scholar in residence and to be around such a, a healthy uh, environment where students are, are inquisitive, wanting to know things. And I, and I look back uh, where I started, back in my hometown, La Puente, and where I grew up, and there were very few young people at that time that could aspire on to higher education. Very few were um, told that they were college material. In fact, there were a lot of barriers at that time. Growing up in the mid-70s, we had the Vietnam War going on. We saw the rise of uh, people like uh, our President John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez. Those were the kind of iconic figures that I remember watching on television. They had a, an impact on me, and I felt a, a, an interest to want to do something to get involved in social change. I didn't know quite how to go about it. Didn't know what that meant. I didn't even think that I could go to college. In fact, some of my, uh, a, a former high school counselor suggested that I become a secretary and, and go into office work. Well, today I can say that my title uh, is and will be Secretary of Labor because you don't lose your title. And it, and it tells you, it says a lot, I think, about where people put barriers, perhaps sometimes they put obstacles in front of you, and what you have to do to get around that and move ahead in spite of what other people might think of you because of where you grow up, because your parents were immigrants, because they didn't have say a public education here, but here in this country we're afforded a lot of opportunities and choices. And I think sometimes we uh, have to weigh, weigh what that means and sometimes it isn't clear for us because we don't have mentors or people that are immediately surrounding us giving us that kind of guidance and advice. It came to me late, later on, when I um, actually uh, left high school and was able to apply and, and come here to Cal Poly Pomona and live on campus meet students from other countries and other states. I felt like I was living 3,000 miles away from La Puente, which was really just 15 minutes from here. But yet it was a life, a life moving and a life challenging experience, one that I'll never forget and that changed the course of, of who I am. So what was it like for you growing up in La Puente as a, a teenager? What, 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 what type of a high school student were you? I was, a, I was an average B student. Um, I wasn't college prep material because you know, we had limited access to many of those programs at that school. It was, uh, I would say, 80% minority school, blue collar, working class. Most uh, youngsters were either told to go into the trades, the military, or some people just you know, went and got married. That's, that was the track for many of the people that I grew up with. I was very fortunate that a, a few of us were, were uh, able to go on into college, and, and in part because there was the ability to get financial aid, because our parents were working class folks. They worked in the local uh, factories in, in the area, 
and always encouraged us to get a good education, but never really thought about how to motivate and get their children into college because no one had ever experienced that. So I was very fortunate that uh, my high school counselor, Mr. Sanchez, really changed that for me and said, you know what, Hilda, let's, let's focus on this. Do you want to do this? If you do, I'll help you. Fill out your applications. We'll do, we'll, f we'll fill out uh, financial aid forms. We'll get everything going in motion. But the choice has to be yours. And I think that for me was, again, uh, a, a big challenge because it would mean leaving the comfort zone of your neighborhood, of your family, of your close-knit family, where you didn't verge out too often. And sometimes women, especially Latinas, were, were told, no, you can't leave the house unless you're married or, or you're doing something else. But other than that, if you go to college, oh my God, that, you know, how, could, how could that happen? So you came to Cal Poly Pomona and you majored in political science. Yes. Why political science? Well, you know, I, I had, when I first came here, I came through the EOP program and you come in as an undeclared student. So you have a chance and opportunity to find out what you, what you really want to focus in on. And I remember changing my, my major three times. I thought I wanted to go into sociology and then eventually law. And I ended up uh, getting, you know, my bachelor's degree in political science with, a, with an option in public administration because I knew that I wanted to work in government as a public servant, not, as, not so much as an elected official. That had never entered my mind. But to really help to give back and make government work for people. I, I had a strong belief that in many ways government could help equalize. It could help further our education. It could help, uh, uh, how could I say, rid our communities of poverty and the inequalities that exist in our, in our society at that time. I really believe that that's the thought process that I was ingrained with. And I think about famous sayings, famous people like President Kennedy who said, you know, uh, don't ask, don't ask uh, you know, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that's a big call. I think that's a big call. And young people have to understand that in many ways, that's what it's still about. If you want to see change, what are you going to do to make that change happen? How are yeah. you going to get involved? Right. So at what point in your uh, young career did you start to really think about running for a political office? It really, it really didn't um, happen overnight. Um, I think after I left Cal Poly, I, you know, I, I was involved in many student organizations here, which helped me as well, kind of gain more confidence, empower me, and see how, how students could even get organized and do things on campus. I became more involved, I'd say, in, in the political scene when I uh, was working on my master's degree. At, at, uh, I had landed an internship at the White House at that time. And it was a short spin in the White House, working there for about a year. And I saw how there was still a lot of need for change and to have people who were reflective of our community. So I figured after, after I had completed my degree that I'd come back home to California. Then I started focusing in on education. And lo and behold, some of my former colleagues and friends said, Hilda, why don't you run for Rio Hondo College Board? We need someone who's going to advocate for our community and our people to go on to get an education. And that was really my first stint to run for uh, Rio Honda Community College Board, representing El Monte and South El Monte. And that's where it took off. And I had no idea that campaigning you know, was going to be so hard, um, knocking on doors, talking to strangers, uh, passing out leaflets, uh, making silkscreen posters, and just getting uh, senior citizens involved and getting young people involved and people who couldn't even vote, high school students, to come out and help walk precincts with me was, was just an incredible experience, a lot of hard work. Yeah, hard, but addicti hard addictive and exhilarating <laughs> at the same time. When we won, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won, but people were telling me we weren't going to win. Right. And I, and you know, in my heart of hearts, you know, I just believe that there's a lot of goodwill out there. And people would ask me, you're too young to run for office. What are you going to do, Hilda? What do you have to contribute? And I said, you know what? I have that desire to see that other people have the same access I did to a better education, to more services that should be lent to our communities. And, and I think that's what motivated people. They said, well, she's got energy. She wants to see, see change. So let's, let's support her. So that led into uh, running for the state, state assembly, assembly and then running uh, for the state senate and then eventually the Congress. But it's 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 always been tough. It's never been a free ride. It's always been about working really hard and engaging the community and spending time, in my belief, uh, quality time with people that you represent. And and my motto was always, 
I'm, I'm your voice. It's not my voice that has to be articulated in these uh, policy decisions or in the halls of Congress or in the halls of the state Senate. It's the public's voice that has to be heard. And I was there to represent people who, who represented working class backgrounds, um, people who were fighting for better paying jobs, for safe jobs, for clean environment, and for health care, and for better services for our seniors. Those were the things that I that I ran on and that I continue to aspire to see change, to see to see that happening uh, still again, because I, I, I think a lot of people right now have really been shaken up because of the, the bad economy that we went through. Now we're recovering, but we still have a lot of repair that has to be done. Okay, and so when you're in the California State Assembly and the Senate, your issue, one of your issues was environmental yes. justice. Yes, yes. And I feel really uh, proud to have been in a good position at the time to be able to move a lot of legislative issues regarding the cleanup of Superfund sites, to make sure that we had open space that we have in the San Gabriel River Mountain Conservancy that was developed with the help of leaders uh, like uh, at that time, uh, Antonio Villaragosa, who was the assembly speaker, and some other members that helped us craft this legislation where we could see communities like ours set aside portions of open space so people could recreate, could have better, healthier lifestyles, reduce asthma, clean up the water table, and provide good jobs. That was the other thing, to make sure that people didn't, didn't have to risk their lives working in dangerous industries. Because my father, as a matter of fact, spent many years working in a battery recycling plant. And many of his colleagues didn't live to, to see him in his old age. They died of cancer, of toxins, contaminants. And we know what that can do to communities if you don't regulate um, those kinds of egregious businesses that, that will not provide cleanup funds for, for what they spew out in the communities. And, and I was very compelled to work on those issues. Environmental justice, taking a chapter out of what uh, President Bill Clinton was doing at that time, back in the mid-90s. He had an executive order on environmental justice. What I did, I looked at that piece of, uh, of policy and, and, and implemented it in the form of legislation. And once we got it through, and it was not an easy task, it was a lot of people against it, a lot of people said, you're going to hurt your own community, Hilda. You're going to eliminate jobs if we have to do this, because people are going to have to spend money for cleaning up. And I'm, and I'm saying to myself, well, wait a minute. What's more important, the quality and life of individuals, of human beings, how can you put a price on that? We should be making sure that we're taking care of our communities. And so we pushed forward. We finally got the bill through when Governor Davis uh, became a governor, and he signed that uh, legislation into law. And it's the first of its kind that was adopted in the, in the nation. After that, 25 states adopted similar uh, legislation. And I'm proud of that because it wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. There was a coalition of different groups that were out there helping us on that issue. Incredible. You served uh, California as the uh, congressional representative for the 31st and 32nd districts from 2001 to 2009. Mm -hmm. What was it like being a congressional representative, leaving California and going to Washington, D.C.? It was hard, because <laughs> I, I had spent uh, eight years in Sacramento representing the people in the, in the San Gabriel Valley, and then to pick up and move almost 3,000 miles and, and work there during the week, a portion of that week, then flying back home. So it was a lot of traveling back and forth, uh, unfamiliar territory, your family's mostly out here in California. Um, it was a different environment, because you're no longer in a small group of say 40 senators now you have uh, well over 300 you know members that are that are there on the floor uh, on different committees and and there's what they call seniority system so you have to spend years just to gain say membership on some key committees and i know a lot of people were were turned off of, about that but i also know that you could still have your voice heard if you got involved and participated and, and worked as a team with your caucus or with other members across the aisle. And I figured that out, having already served in the legislature, that's how you get things done. So I worked really hard, tried to do the best I could, but it got, uh, it started to change, I think, back in, I'd say around 2006, 2007, when we started to see the economy kind of going sour, and you started to see, uh, you know, just a, a different mindset in the Congress. People weren't as collegial. And there were a lot of people that got elected, um, you know, from, from the other side of the aisle that, that came in with very different agenda, not really wanting to work and understand and really get to know 
uh, members. So that changed quite a bit, and I saw it in full practice when I became a cabinet uh, secretary because I'd have to go now testify before these committees of jurisdiction. Many of the people that I knew were no longer there. Some, some who did remain, though, were very cordial and friendly, but, you know, it was just a different place, different place entirely. So the approval rating of congressional members now is at an all-time low. Uh, the majority of Americans say that Washington is broken. Uh, why is it broken? I, you know, to be honest, I think if you ask people from their particular district, they might say that their congressperson is not the problem. That's typically what is said. I would say, though, that the, the change in the House has, in, since 2010 changed dramatically the makeup of, of uh, members that, that got elected. Um, and I think that they came in with a, a very uh, narrow focus and um, are not, are not um, maybe well versed in, in terms of, of how things actually work. And, and how uh, our government was formed to have checks and balances. So it's the executive branch, judici judicial branch, and then you have you know, the House of Representatives, the Congress and the Senate. And those are the checks and balances and they should all work accordingly. And right now I, I, I see that they're not all working in tandem. And we know that because we've, ha we've seen gridlock back uh, last year. We saw the debt ceiling um, just run us over, the shutdown of the federal government. And it's very unpleasant because it hurts our economic strength and our global uh, reputation. And um, I think this time they managed to kind of get away from that, which is good. But we have a lot of issues that we still have to tackle. We still have to create more jobs, create more incentives for investments, for infrastructure, and, to, and see that people get good wages. So President's talking about minimum wage, raising the minimum wage. I happen to believe that that's a good thing. And I think 60 to 70% of the population agree, both sides of the aisle, they agree. What's the problem? I mean, it Congress, seems like... The Congress, uh, they don't want to bring it up in the House of Representatives, and you need to look at the leadership that's controlling the agenda, what the floor uh, agenda looks like, what the votes, you know, when, when committees are, would allow bills to be, um, would allow bills to be presented before the entire House. So if that's being held back, then you don't have progress and you don't have movement. Just like the immigration debate, which is another issue that I think that if it were to be brought up now, it would probably get voted on. But there are certain powers that be that don't want that to happen. What were some of your greatest achievements as the Secretary of Labor in the first Obama administration? I was very proud to be able to see the implementation of uh, green jobs, the creation of green jobs, and training of blue-collar job workers, okay? So people who were in, say, manufacturing and, and other kinds of, uh, you know, heavy heavy labor-intensive jobs now be switched out into renewable energy, conservation, solar panel installation, uh, other high-tech hybrids and industries that were growing that really make up a, a big part of California and Southern California. And to be able to see how we have to change that transition, that we're making things, we're producing things, we're not just importing products and outsourcing these jobs to other countries, but really focusing in on putting people back to work here in good middle class jobs, jobs that pay well. And I think that was, I think, my biggest, you know, biggest uh, effort was to focus in on helping the president get there and to also help incentivize young people to give them jobs because we had a high rate of, when we saw the recession hit us, we, uh, almost 25% and higher for, uh, young, for young people between the ages of, say, 16 to 24. It was that cohort that just couldn't get any jobs. There was, no, there was very little movement, and of course, that creates other problems, societal problems for us. So it was about getting them employed, getting them trained, and also making sure that the returning veterans, many of them who are young, who represent our communities, their only job was in the military. And for them to come home and face the fact that there wasn't a job here for them required us to work with the Veterans Affairs, to work with um, HHS, to work with everybody, not just uh, Department of Labor, but all the other uh, cabinet members to see how we could quickly put people back to work, including the veterans who deserve that. They served us well, um, you know, they served in our, in our wars, and we made a commitment, the President did, about trying to make sure that we could at least have a, a seamless transition, and, and, and it needs a lot of help. Even today, right now, we still have a lot of young people that are going to need 
uh, wraparound assistance, health care, VA assistance, many that are going through post-traumatic post stress syndrome that are going to need help. And I know Cal Poly, I understand, has a program that's helping with that. And right. I think that's commendable. We ought to be having those programs everywhere. Right. You know, rarely do we get an opportunity to speak to somebody who knows a president <laughs> on a professional and personal level. And so I want to take this opportunity to ask you, what was um, President Obama like as a boss and what was he like as a person? He's a very intelligent, very capable man, very humble man, and uh, uh, I think a very well-meaning and thoughtful individual. I got to know him on a personal level and I, I know that that often doesn't happen because it isn't often that cabinet members are always uh, in the same setting as the president. He's on, say, overseas, uh, taking care of diplomacy or involved in, in so many things that uh, I may only see him in passing or maybe uh, attaching myself to a flight on Air Force One to get out to, say, a location where we have maybe bilateral relations with other foreign countries in Latin America, which we did. Colombia, Mexico, El Salvador. I got to travel with him on many occasions. And in many ways, I was also sent out by myself. I felt a great sense of honor and pride that he allowed me to do that, that, he, that somehow in his thinking, he wanted to see this, uh, his, this cabinet representative of the country. And I think uh, having been one of the first Latina women, that isn't, that isn't the only reason why you get selected. It's about, it's about who you are, what you do, what you represent and what your experiences have been. And I'd like to just share this. I, I knew uh, Senator Obama before he became president-elect and, and president. And our staffs, when I was in the Congress, would work together. We worked on health care issues, health care disparity, teenage pregnancy, environmental justice, community-based uh, organizing, things like that that, we, that our offices kind of collaborated on. So he knew about me and I knew about him. I think the, uh, the First Lady, Michelle Obama, has a capacity to be the president herself. <laughs> she has the, uh, the charisma, the intellect. Yes. She has everything. She has it. What was your relationship like with her? What was she like? Wonderful. Um, what I liked about her is that she was very clear on her values. Her family came first. Um, she cared a great deal about young people. And her, her whole effort was to focus on uh, elevating and, and rising up young people, uh, people that um, may have had different tra tragedies in their life. She also took on this whole effort to combat obesity in our communities and creating uh, opportunity for people to start to grow their own vegetables and eat healthier and exercise and, and all of that. But she also did a great deal to help support the employment of veterans and spent a lot of time on advocating for women's issues and inequality that exists in, between females and males and, and wa the wage gap uh, problems and issues that currently exist, and I think that had that that had a, a, a you know a, a great deal of impact on the policies that the president was pushing out because she was right there as well. So I mean, it's wonderful to have her there. I had an opportunity to interact with her many times. I even flew with her on on occasion to some events, and she was always gr uh, gracious and grateful, a lot of gratitude, very humble, uh, approachable. She came to the Department of Labor two or three times while I was there, and I and she came and sat, and we have a child care center. We had a child care center. It's still there, the Department of Labor. She came and read to the students, and we, we passed out uh, meals to them after, and she took pictures. She was only going to stay maybe 20 minutes. She ended up staying an hour, and an, over an hour, and her staff was getting all upset because <laughs> they wanted her to, to go on to the next right, event. But right. um, she had a good time, and she's just a regular you know, human being with a lot of dignity and respect and cares yeah. a great deal about yeah. this country, yeah. you know. And she's given up a lot too, she sacrificed a lot. Now that you are back home, uh, what does this area, Los Angeles County, this region, what does it need? We need a lot of um, help in developing good jobs and economic development. And it has to start also with our young people, investing in education, making sure that they don't have to go the same route I did, that hopefully they can get 
there quicker and understand that getting the ready skills that they need early on through uh, preschool and Head Start, all these programs are very helpful. And to expand that, make sure we have better health care services and a safety net for young people. That we also have a safety net for people who need good health care. And hopefully with the Affordable Care Act, we'll see those costs reduce, you know, uh, ratcheting down and more people able to get health care. And, and just to see that our economy is working, that our transportation systems, our light rail systems continue to be developed, that we reduce congestion and pollution, that we keep open space. I think that's really important. And also making sure that the county and uh, county government, all governments are working together. So that means other city governments, the state government, and the federal government all coming together. And instead of fighting each other or, f or feeling that, oh, this is my uh, property or my territory and I can't verge out outside of that, no, we can't afford to do that anymore. We have to come together and say, okay, these are the top priorities for this area, economic development, uh, we should be looking at a cleaner environment. We should also be looking at good jobs that pay families enough so that you can raise a family and be in the middle class. And also make sure that we take care of our elderly and the people that need help. Um, that's what the county does. They're mandated to be the safety net, the last resort. And we have to make sure that that safety net is sustained. What type of words of wisdom would you give youth in this area that are challenged in so many different ways? your story is their story. What types of words of encouragement and inspiration would you give to them? Don't ever give up and don't let anybody tell you no. <laughs> I think what happened to me was that I'm, I, I tend to be pretty stubborn and I think when people tell me no I see that as a challenge because then I'll try to figure out how to how to still get to my goal but get around that and hopefully win people over while you're doing it so that you're not alienating people but you're actually helping to bring about better better and more forceful change and I think that's really really important and to give back so whatever it is if you are successful in any job even as an entrepreneur in private business or whatever give back to your community and don't forget that person behind you uh, you know extend your hand give them a helping hand show them the way someone helped me and I know someone probably helped you too. And it's, it's about giving back and understanding each other. And I think that's what we, that's what we owe ourselves and our society. Secretary Solis, thank you for coming to the studio today. You have a powerful story, it's inspirational. Your charisma, your sensitivity and your compassion is not just inspirational for me, but for a nation full of uh, people who need to be inspired. So thank you again for coming in and uh, sharing these words of wisdom uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you so much.